Sides in the front cabin and the open sides around the upper deck. Boyan's apparatus, consisting of life rooms and life rafts, is stored around the outside of the upper deck and above the front cabin. In the event of any emergency, please remain calm and await further instructions from the skipper and crew. If you are accompanying small children, please keep them with you at all times. And if you have bird food purchased either from our gift shop or on board, please throw it well clear of the vessel. Ensure also that this is the only thing which you throw overboard. All rubbish must be placed in the bins provided or taken ashore. Finally, as with all our public sailings, there is to be no smoking on any part of this boat. We thank you for your cooperation, and if you have any questions or if there is anything we can do to make your trip more enjoyable, please do not hesitate to ask a member of staff. We're now leaving the centre of Windsor to our left, while on the opposite bank to our right is Eton, with some of the Eton College boathouses lying on the waterfront. Rowing is a popular activity at Eton, the boys are choosing either that or cricket as their summer sport. Those who choose cricket are known as dry bobs, whilst the rowers are called wet bobs. We are now proceeding upstream on the River Thames, which takes us in a roughly westerly direction. This will lead eventually to Oxford and beyond, though to reach Oxford would take approximately two days by the river from here. This is mainly due to the 23 knots between here and the middle of Oxford, each one taking up to half an hour to the to take a day. There is a speed limit on the upper Thames of a little under 5 miles an hour, and to which the Thames takes a very meandering course, so all in all it's not the place to be if you are too much in a hurry. Incidentally, the college owns nearly all of the land on our right hand side from here to well beyond our turning point. They in fact own portions of land in many parts of the country, this being largely due to an outdated practice whereby parents of Eton boys used to donate land to the college in order to offset fees. Through the trees to our left shortly, you will see a full-size replica of a Hawker Hurricane fighter plane. This is a memorial to its designer, Sir Sidney Cam, whose former home stands a few hundred yards beyond. This plane bears the markings of one flown in the Battle of Britain by squadron leader John Grandy, who was constable and governor of Windsor Castle from 1978 to 1988. Sir Sidney Cam was a pupil of Royal Free School in Windsor. During this time, a record of 727 miles per hour. Cam's final design was the Harrier which remained in RAF service for 50 years until 2010, and is still flown by the US Marines as the AV-8B. Ahead of us is the Windsor Railway Bridge, being one of several across the Thames designed by Isambard King Brunel, the famous Victorian engineer. The bridge was completed in 1849 for Victoria, and it brought the Great Western Railway Network right up to the front of Windsor Castle. The design of this bridge was unique in its day, as were many of Brunel's designs. This one, because the 187 foot central span is not secure to the sides in any way, it simply rests down with its own weight and six bearings, allowing for expansion and contraction of the ironworks during temperature changes. This type of span is known as a bowstring arch, and the brick viaduct was constructed between 1861 and 1865, replacing an original wooden trestle structure. The arches were incorporated into the design to prevent flood water from being trapped on the upstream side in the event of the Thames bursting its banks. It's also believed to be Brunel's oldest surviving structure still in continuous use, 
and was granted Grade II listed status in 1975. In 1883, Windsor Central Station became part of the London Underground Network when the district line was extended from Eden Broadway to Windsor using the tracks of the Great Western Railway. However, this was short-lived as the service was withdrawn in 1885. The land to our left forms part of Bard's Island, so-called because in the days before Windsor had a purpose-built swimming pool, the channel behind the island was closed to boats during the summer months, providing the people of Windsor with a safe swimming area. In 1870, Queen Victoria disapproved of the site of Vegas from the water train and had them moved to the downstream end of the island. Then in 1904, the area by the railway was used again, but this time with men on the downstream side of the bridge in the eastern baths and ladies upstream in the western baths. To our left is the Windsor Leisure Centre, being the current incarnation of Windsor Swimming Facility. It replaces an earlier outdoor pool. The centre stands on the site of the once famous Wooden Tip Club of the 1960s. The Wooden Tip was a well-known live music venue in its day. It started out at the Star and Garter of Windsor Town Centre in 1962, before moving to a semi derelict mansion on this site called Pure Meads in 1964. Many of today's major acts, such as The Who, The Rolling Stones, Stevie Wonder and Pink Floyd, made some of their early appearances here, and it was at the Wicked Tip that the previously unheard of Jimi Hendrix made his UK debut. The mural coming up on our right, stretching across the base of the bridge, was commissioned in 2012 as part of the London Olympic Games, as it is on what was known as the Winter Games Hall, leading to Dawn Lake about two miles upstream. The vendor hosted the Rowan and Police Winter Games. Painted by London artist Cosmo Sarsen, the mural will put 16 places representative of the London Olympic today. Residents include the Australian singer and actress Natalie Imbruglia, who in fact has called one of her albums White Lily's Island. set into the ground near the end of the point. It's called a strapping or turning post and goes back to the days of horse drawn barges. As the barges approach the point, the tow rope would be taken off the horse in a few turns made around the post. This would allow the barge to swing safely around the point under its own momentum in a pendulum-like motion. Had they not done this, the barge would have continued on in a straight line towards the opposite bank, probably pulling the unfortunate horse in behind it. Through the trees to our left is Windsor Racecourse. We will see more of this at various stages right up to our turnaround point. We're currently passing the area behind the grandstands. Racing began here at Windsor in 1866 and continues on to this day with regular Monday evening meetings and some weekends throughout the summer.
to our left is the parade room of Windsor Racecourse. This course is unique in that it stands entirely on an island. It's called Ray's Island and it's in fact the largest of the upper Thames being the Batson Island Again, the Thames Island Club. This one is Canfee Island on the Thames Estuary beyond London. It's also one of only two figure of eight courses in the country. The track having been laid out in this way, in order to fit the required length of track into the limited space offered by the island. Below the bench is a stone block, bearing the instruction, get at once into the water or behind the screens whenever a boat comes in sight of Davis aboard. As in those days, the boys used to swim naked in the style of the ancient Greeks, hence the name Athens. Looking to our left now, through the trees, we can see across the track of the interface course. In the distance, the tops of some boats may be visible. This is the Windsor Race Course Yacht Basin, situated on the mill stream which forms Ray's Island. As we travel along the tree-lined banks of the Thames, there is an abundance of bird life to be found. Among the most common is the mallard duck, the male of which has the unfortunate combination of a green head and orange feet. Less common are tufted ducks with their bright yellow eyes showing clearly against a black head, which has a small tail at the back. In some parts there are families of the more ornate mandarin duck, and there have been sightings of other species such as maganza and pochard. Herons are often seen standing motionless at the water's edge, waiting to pounce on passing fish. They are probably none too impressed with the increasing number of cormorants now moving in down. This large black diving bird is a saltwater species, but in recent years they have started to colonise the Thames, no doubt having realised the rich pickings to be had from the abundant fish life. The crested green also dives for fish, and it is so well adapted for this role that its legs right at the back of its streamlined body it is completely unable to stand on land. The egret is related to the home but is small and completely white, and although very rare, it has been sighted on this river. The kingfisher is another prey to be well, and although fairly common, it is hard to spot. Being quite small and fast moving, it is often only seen as a flash of electric blue darting through the trees or across the water. There is the whale family, which includes the moorhen with its black body and red face and the coots, which is black, with a white face and beak. Coots defend their territory with more attractive Egyptian views. Looking to the skies, we sometimes see kestrels hovering over the fields. Similar in size and colour is the hobby, which swoops and turns over the water catching insects. The red kite, with its distinctive forked tail and finding half the king's bag, is now common all along the Thames Valley, having been reintroduced following the eradication of the giants. As well as the bird species, there is the otter, which though non-existent in the Thames a few years ago, is now well established on some stretches, thanks once again to a program of reintroduction. More common is the mink, which although not a native species, has done very well in the Thames. Originally bred in activity for their fur, some have found their way into the wild, having a serious effect on native fauna, due to their hunting ability, taking both birds and their eggs. Due to the significance and uniqueness of bird life on the Upper Thames, 
French brothers now operate a dedicated bird and wildlife watching crews in the Windsor area. Details of this are in our timetable and website, and these places are strictly limited, putting this essential. We'd just like to thank you for your continued cooperation and understanding during these current restrictions and to remind you to remain seated and to invite you to disembark in your groups at the end of this trip. Ahead of us now is Bobby Lock at our turnaround point. The lock and wheel are built around the island ahead of us and the set of grey gates to the right is the entrance to the lock chamber which allows boats to bypass the weir, making the changing level from one side to the other. Boats continuing upstream from here will enter the lock chamber, the gates will close behind them and water from the upstream side will flow into the chamber through sluice gates below water level. This flooding of the lock will raise the boats until the water level in the chamber is equal to the level on the upstream side, at which point the upstream gates can open, allowing boats to continue their journey. The reverse process then allows passage for boats travelling downstream and the flooding and draining of the lock chamber is simply achieved using the force of gravity. There are no pumps involved. Between the lock and the island a set of rollers can be seen. These allow users of small boats and skiffs to manually negotiate their passage. The source of the Thames is called the Thames Head and is close to Sirencester and the Cotswold Pillars in Gloucestershire. It flows downhill following the gradient of the land and for the first 140 miles it passes through 45 of these lock stations, spaced along this section which is known as the Upper Thames. The Upper Thames drops in elevation by about 300 feet and these lock and rear systems allow the drop to a painful. Allowing a faster flow during wet weather prevents a build-up in level which can lead to flooding, while in dry weather the river gates are closed in, pulling water back but maintaining a safe depth for boats to navigate. Indeed, the lock keepers maintain a chain of communication along the river, keeping the upper Thames at a more or less constant level throughout the year. Towards the right-hand end of the weir is the Salmon Manor, this being a narrow channel divided lengthways by a series of baffles which slow the water down and cause slight backflow, assisting the migrating salmon in their arduous journey to the source of the river. Salmon were successfully reintroduced to the Thames in 1982 after a long absence, and they've become firmly re-established since then. This is mainly due to the cleanliness of the water these days. The Thames, in fact, being now officially recognised as one of the world's cleanest metropolitan rivers, that is to say, one which flows through the major towns and cities. This was not always the case, though, and in the 1800s, the river was so badly polluted that it was declared dead in the London area, and that no fish or bird life could survive in or around the water. The smell of the river was unbearable to those who lived or worked near it. Diseases such as typhoid and cholera were rife, and this period was known as the Great Stink. For Londoners, things improved greatly in the 1850s with the building of closed at the Battle Jets and closed sewage system. And elsewhere along the river, many improvements have been made, and the process continues to this day. The colour of the water is deceptive, despite looking down to the brownish green tea that is caused by naturally occurring sediments and microorganisms. Having turned around, we now embark on the downstream of the Battle Jets, which will take us to London and then on to the North Sea. And for the same reasons as mentioned before, the journey from here to central London will take in the region of 12 hours. However, we are not limited to the River Thames, in fact, much of England is linked by canals and rivers. The first canals were built by the Romans for the purposes of irrigation, as well as linking navigable rivers. 
to our left is the village of Eaton Wick, being close to but entirely separate from Eaton itself. In the distance beyond Eaton Wick, some tall factory chimneys are visible. These form part of the Slough Industrial Estate, reckoned to be the largest in Western Europe. The chimneys form part of a power station, next to which is the Mars factory, where amongst many other confectionery items, they are able to produce somewhere in the region of 2 million Mars bars in a day. Slough is a town of some notoriety. The wartime poet John Benjamin penned the famous line Come Friendly Bombs and Fall on Slough. And in more recent years, the town was used as the backdrop for the comedy series The Office, starring Ricky Gervais and Martin Freeman. they paid fees and lived in the town outside the college buildings. These students became known as Oppidans, from the Latin word Oppidan, meaning town. In fact, in those days, the boys were required to speak Latin at all times, risking punishment if they failed to do so. To this day, the college at any time has 70 key scholars as they are known, in honour of their origins. There are also music, foundation and sixth form scholarships, meaning that at any time around 20% of the boys are subject to reduced fees and in some cases no fees at all. The college in fact states that no parent or talented boy should feel that eating is necessarily beyond their means, dispelling the myth that only the very wealthy can aspire to sending their sons to eating. The college has a fond association with King George III, who spent much of his 60-year reign at Windsor Castle and visited East of the three arches which are reminiscent of the famous willow pottery pattern. The backwater beyond the bridge is the Cuckoo Weir stream, and although there is no weir on this stretch of water, it was considered as the location for one, which was subsequently built at Bodmin. A little further along this stream is the headquarters of Swan Life Line, one of several charities along the Thames which care for sick and injured swans. Swans on the Thames fall under three divisions of ownership, those being the Wayne Wire and the city livery companies of Dyers and Vintners. This tradition goes back to the 12th century when the reigning monarch held claim to all wild swans in the Thames, 
As in those days, swans were a popular source of food for royalty. Then under a royal charter in the 15th century, the city livery companies were granted an equal share, and the ceremony of swan upping began. This involved representatives of the two livery companies and the royal household rowing upriver, catching and marking all that year's signets in order to establish ownership. This annual event continues to this day in the third week of July. Originally, the birds were marked by cutting marks into their beaks, but now a band is placed around a bird's leg bearing a serial number. Swan upping serves as a census as it records numbers of swans, and the birds are also checked for weight and general condition. The swan's diet consists mainly of green vegetation, and it's for this reason that the branches of some of the willow trees appear to have been neatly trimmed a foot or two above water level. Hastily assembled, of which about 150 are still in existence. Often being of wooden construction, these little ships can usually be recognised by a small glass plaque of the wheelhouse inscribed with Dunkirk 1940. They may also fly the flag of the Association of Dunkirk Little Ships, which is the cross of St George with the crest of Dunkirk in the centre. On the left-hand bank, between here and the railway bridge, we'll pass two small green foot bridges. These are the upper and lower barge of bridges. As their name suggests, they were originally built to facilitate the pulling of horse-drawn barges. The bridges cross the downstream ends of the Kuku Weir stream, which divides a little further up. This intriguing stretch of water can be seen by taking one of our half-hour explorer trips, which depart from the tea gardens near Jacob Diamond. Operating in fair weather during the peak season, the low-level 12-seat open going is ideal to negotiate the low trees and bridges, while skimming over the shallow riverbed, affording a unique view of wildlife and the untrodden overgrown banks. This boat also passes close to the Squad Lifeline Centre. Defensibility with views along the Thames Valley, allowing him to guard the western approaches to London. Prior to the Roman Conquest, Edward the Confessor had held court at the Royal Manor of Kingsbury, in what we now know as Old Windsor, until his death in January 1066. The proximity to the River Thames was no doubt the prime reason for choosing this location, the waterway being the main highway to London on the east. After the Norman Conquest, William built a ring of fortresses within one day's march of London, of which Windsor is undoubtedly the finest. In addition, the extensive Windsor Forest offered excellent hunting, and William chose to live there until his death in 1087. The concept of castles was unknown to the Saxons, and it was part of William's plan to ensure the permanent of the conquest. The castle has been added to by various monarchs, but always to the benefit of its opinions. To the arrival of King George IV. He employed the architect James Wyatt, who did much to reshape and modernise the castle, improving the movements of the buildings. He then realised the need to raise the height of the round tower so that it once more stood proud of the surrounding structures. An extra 32 feet was added to its height, making it now stand at 220 feet above the level of the river at Windsor. On top of the round tower is the all important flagstaff, where traditionally the reigning monarch will fly their own world standard when they're in residence at the castle, and when the monarch is not in residence, the union flag is flown.
approach the end of our trip, we see Windsor Bridge coming into view ahead. There is likely to have been a wooden crossing here in the 1100s following the construction of the castle. Records show that in 1242 permission was granted for oak trees to be felled in Windsor Forest for the construction of a new bridge between Windsor and Eton. This stood until 1819, when after damage and deterioration, a replacement was decided upon. The architect Sir Charles Hollis designed the bridge you see here today, using cast iron on buttresses of granite, and it was completed in 1824. The Windsor Corporation used to charge tolls for crossing the bridge, but after much public protest, these were abolished in 1898. In 1970, an underwater survey showed that the buttresses were becoming undermined by water erosion and it was no longer safe to carry the weight of mining traffic, so it was pedestrianised. Fortunately, Queen Elizabeth Bridge had been opened four years earlier and was able to carry all roads of traffic in north out of Windsor. The white frame of bay window to the right of the bridge is part of the Sir Christopher Wren Hotel, so good because for many years it was believed that the building was built and lived in by Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of the 17th and 18th centuries. However, in recent years it was realised that no evidence exists to show that this was his home. Whilst it is known that Wren did indeed live in Windsor when his father became the Dean of Windsor, it is not known where. Wren was responsible for designing the Dome of St Paul's Cathedral, the London Observatory and 51 London churches after the Great Fire of 1666. He also completed the building of the Windsor Guildhall, started by Sir Thomas Fitz, who died before completion. to a fuller service as soon as the situation allows and our website will be updated accordingly so please visit this at frenchbrothers.co.uk Here you will find details of our other trips as well as private hire and special events so whether you're tempted by a supper cruise, live jazz, murder mystery, casino or secondary revival we have something to suit your taste and for the steam enthusiast there are a range of trips and for the chance to enjoy the Thames and the style of the Victorians on either one of our qualified steamboats. Please take one of our public trip timetables. This gives details of all our scheduled sailings, and these trips are also available for group hire. Please make sure that you have all your personal belongings with you. And once again, thank you very much for cruising with us today.